Acts chapter 2. And let's read verse 14. After the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost, 120 of the disciples were all abundantly drunk in the Holy Spirit. And they literally were staggering around like a drunk person. And they all spoke in different, different languages. The languages of which the multitude of people were gathered in Jerusalem. Because the Bible says, everybody heard them speaking in their own tongue. After this event, when there was confusion and everybody was wondering what's happening, what did the Apostle Peter do? You know, you all know by now, the Apostle Peter was a natural born leader. He was always standing up for wrong reasons. <laughs> but after he was converted, now he is standing up for the right reason. Amen. So now he stood up. What did he say? Verse 14. But Peter, standing up with the leaven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, You men of Judea, and all you that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you and hearken to my words. For these are not drunk as you suppose, seeing it is but the third hour of the day. But this is that which was spoken through the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams, and on my servants and on my handmaidens I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in heaven above, and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness, and the moon into blood, before the great and not notable day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Amen. The Apostle Peter quoted this passage of scripture from Joel chapter 2 verses 28 to 32. Now there is a problem here. The problem is this. In verse 17 or verse 16, he says, But this is that which was spoken through the prophet Joel. What was happening? The people getting drunk, speaking in tongues, that experience, he tallies that to the prophecy in Joel 2, 28 to 32 and said, This is the fulfillment. This is that which was spoken. But if you look at the scripture and compare them to what happened on the day of Pentecost, you'll find that it is not the direct fulfillment of Joel 2.28. For example, let's look at the scripture again in verse 17. And it shall come to pass in the last day, saith God, I will pour out my spirit. So the primary thing is the pouring out of the Spirit. So when the Spirit is poured out, what is the result of it? Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your, old, your young men shall see visions. And your old men shall dream dreams. Now, let's make a comparison to see whether is this an actual fulfillment of Joel 2.28? Now look at the first part of the scripture in verse 17. I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. Now I am sure every one of you here are intelligent people. Are you? Okay. Let's test your intelligence now. What is one and one? See, you are 
Wrong. Wrong answer. I, I did not say one plus one. I say one and one. Eleven, right? Uh oh. Okay, you failed the first test. Let's try again. You have another opportunity to redeem yourself. Okay? And I hope you will do it right this time. But I will make it simple for you. Okay? Two plus two. Very good. You passed the test. <laughs> See, all of you are very intelligent. Now, question number three. Now, what is all flesh? All flesh means all, right? But on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit fell upon only the Jewish people. It was not upon all flesh. All flesh will include the Jewish people and the Gentiles. Agreed, everybody? See, all of you are intelligent. All agrees? But on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit fell only upon the Jewish people. This is number one. Number two. Joel 2.28 says, Your sons, your young men, and old women, and old men, they will all receive the Holy Spirit. Sons referred to in the Hebrew, children below the age of 12. So they were children, youths, and elderly people. But in the Acts, when the Holy Ghost was poured out, everyone were adults. The 120 of them were adults. No children were there, no youths were there. So, this is problem area number two. Now problem area number three. When the Holy Ghost was poured out on the day of Pentecost, they all spoke in unknown tongues. But Joel 2.28 says, when the Holy Spirit is poured out, your sons and your daughters will see visions. They will prophesy. This did not happen on the day of Pentecost. So this tells us that what happened on the day of Pentecost was a partial fulfillment of Joel 2.28. So, there is a day, another greater fulfillment of Joel 2.28. Now, turn your Bibles with me to Joel chapter 2. To look at the exact fulfillment or the exact quotation of Joel 2.28. From Joel chapter 2 verse 28 right up to verse 31 or part of verse 32 the apostle Paul or Peter quoted it very accurately but if you look at Joel 2 very carefully it tells us when the time when this anointing will be poured out when will it be poured out you need to look at verse 23 up to 27 for an answer. When will this anointing be poured out? Be glad then you children of Zion and rejoice in the Lord your God for he hath given you the former rain moderately and he will cause to come down for you the rain, the former rain and the latter rain in the first month. What happened on the day of Pentecost? was the outpouring of the former rain. So there is another rain, which is not just the latter rain, but the former rain plus the latter rain. So all together, all the former rains that you read of in the Bible, all the anointings, all the powers that you read from Genesis to Revelation, Plus, the new that God is going to do. 
he is going to pour that out in the last days. When will he pour out? Verse 24. And the floors shall be full of wheat, and the vats shall overflow with wine and oil. That refers to the church overflowing with believers. And I will restore to you the years that the locusts had eaten, and the canker worm, and the caterpillar, and the palmer worm, my great army which I sent among you. So whatever you have lost, in terms of lost call, lost anointing, lost years, lost time, you missed the call of God on your life. You wasted your time, you wandered in the wilderness. Now you repent, you come back to God. And God tells you, I'm going to restore the lost years. The lost years. The years that you lost. The times that you lost. The seasons that you lost. He is going to restore back. Amen. 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 Which means, that does not mean. God is going to add on years into your life just like what he did for King Hezekiah. Not that. What it means is, let's say for example, you are 50 years old now. And the first 25 years old, 25 years of your life, you miss God. And you are running around. You miss your call. You miss God. Then suddenly... At your 30th year, you wake up. When you wake up, most people will regret their lost years. Have you been there? Okay. So you regret and you cry and you re repent. You, you repent saying, the Lord, please forgive me for, waste, for the wasted years. Have you done that? Now God says to you, the remaining 10 years of your life or the 10 years that you're going to run for the Lord, the 30 years that you lost, he's going to add to the 10 years and you will do the works in the 10 years what you miss in the 30 years. The years will be added to you. Amen. The tranker worm, the palmer worm and the caterpillar those years that you lost will be added to you. And what that which you allowed the devil to steal away from you, those will be restored back to you. The grace of God, the gifts and the anointings of God, which you may have foolishly lost, now God is going to restore them back, add them back to you. For whatever reason, you may have lost your church or lost your members. Either the devil stole it or somebody splitted your church. God is going to restore. Restore. That which the palmer worm had eaten. That which the caterpillar has eaten. That which the cranker worm has eaten. And that which the locust has eaten. Four kinds of enemies. They are going to be restored back. Now when will all this happen? Now look at verse 26. And you shall eat in plenty and be satisfied and praise the name of the Lord your God who hath dealt wondrously with you and my people shall never be ashamed. And you shall know that I am in the midst of Israel. Now, this scripture gives us the clue when this will happen. This was not a time in the first century because the Romans were still ruling Israel and the Jewish people were slaves to Israel. They were not eating in plenty. They were revolting against the Roman rule. They were not sleeping peacefully. So this scripture is not during the first century. This scripture is about the present time in Israel after 1948. Now, they are living in peace. Now, 
they are living in plenty. Now they are eating the works of their hands freely without any master ruling over them. So which means Joel 2.28 is going to be fulfilled in these last days. In these last days. That's number one. Number two. Look at the scripture. I shall pour out my spirit upon all flesh. So all flesh includes the Christians as well as non-Christians. Which means, even if you are a non-Christian, you come within the perimeter of a church or of a crusade ground, you shall be saved. You shall be anointed with the Holy Ghost. Your eyes will be open. You will see visions. This is an outright promise of God. All flesh. All flesh. Let me share with you a, a testimony to prove this scripture. Several years ago, a young minister of God, whom I know very well, living in South India, he conducted a crusade in an open field in the city of Chennai. And uh, there were several thousands of people, mostly young people, who gathered for the three days of crusade. So they were, and this minister of God, he's overly blessed with the singing anointing. So he ministers in worship, dance, sings, and then he preaches the word of God. So being a singing minister, Naturally, they'll have light, sound, colors, everything. Right? And they'll have loud music, big choir, big singing, and then lots of dancers. So that's how he always does his festivals of praise. So being in an open field, the sound of the loud singing was traveling far and wide. Now besides the grounds, there was a ladies hostel where some college students were staying so that one particular evening two girls about 20 something one girl was a Hindu the other girl was a Muslim both of them are not Christians so after their evening dinner they decided to go for a walk as they were walking they saw the sky lit it up just across the street. And they could hear some kind of sound coming from the area. So they thought, let's just walk around to see what is this light and sound. So they came to the grounds. And they saw at a far end, there was a stage that was lighted up. And there was rainbow colors, like you know those disco lights that blinks black and white or multicolors, not black and white. So they could see all that. And so the Hindu girl told her Muslim friend, let's go nearer, closer to see. So they came quite close to the fringe where the crusade ground was. So they didn't want to go closer and sit among the crowd because they didn't know what this was all about. So they stood quite at the end of the, a few feet away from the last row of the grounds. And there was singing, there was dancing. They were, you know, being young, they were beginning to move and jive. You know, that is the kind of anointing upon the African people. <laughs> right? When they come up to sing, you can never stand straight. You can never do that. Am I right? Yes. No, even though you are stiff like a stick, the moment they start singing, you will automatically go. <laughs> am I right, everybody? All the non-blacks, am I right? If your, your fingers will go thumping, and your feet will go thumping, and before you know it, you are jumping up and down. <laughs> So, 
This was the same anointing that was was going on in the ground. So these girls, you know, from a very straight jacket family, they were not dancing, but being young, were used to all the dance and the songs that they see in the movies. They began to just move their body to the left and the right a little bit. And after all the songs, now the time came for the man of God to preach the word of God. So he preached a simple salvation message. And then he gave the altar call. So a few people in the crowd, they answered the altar call. These two girls, they didn't know what was happening. They were just standing and watching. Then the minister of God began to pray. As he was praying. Now later on, this was a testimony from those two girls. The Hindu girl, she comes from a very orthodox Hindu family. In the, in the, in the Indian culture, she comes from what we would call a Brahmin family. The Brahmins are the priesthood. Very orthodox. That girl's spiritual eyes were open and she saw the Lord Jesus Christ standing on the stage beside that man of God. She blinked her eyes several times and she literally saw. You know, everybody have an imagination how the Lord Jesus looks like based on paintings and pictures that we have. And what she saw fitted perfectly to the pictures of the Lord Jesus that she had seen. A tall man about six foot wearing a flowing white garment standing beside the preacher lifting up his hands to bless the people. She was shocked. Her, she saw this with her naked eyes. And during that time of prayer for the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the Muslim girl was filling the Holy Spirit. She did not respond to it. She did not ask for it. But when the Holy Ghost fell, this girl was filling the Holy Spirit and she began to speak in unknown tongues. What is this? All flesh. Amen. So the Holy Spirit being poured out. See, if you come within the fringes, when the rain falls, it, it, all it needs is just one drop of the rain to touch you. Just one drop is enough to pull you into the kingdom of God. Amen. 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 Come and clap your hands and give glory to God. All flesh. All flesh. All flesh. That is why Joel chapter 2, the last phrase of verse 32 says, and in the remnant whom the Lord shall call, or the first part of verse 32, and it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Every one of them shall be saved. So this is what it means. Restoration of the lost years. Which means you don't labor hard as you have done in the past. Because this last move is going to be a sovereign work of God. Without any human intervention. Sovereign work of God. So that no man can take credit for what God is going to do. Amen. 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 Let me give you one good example. We saw that the vessel with oil. And you clearly heard. Pastor Johnny Taylor saying that he had never seen the oil increasing with his own eyes. He, he said that, right? He never saw that. Which tells me one thing when I was hearing that, which meant that he had no part to play in working a miracle for the oil to come out of the Bible or for the oil to increase. He had no part. If you compare that to the miracles done by the prophets in the Bible, 
they worked a miracle. For example, Elijah and Elisha, when there was a lack in their host houses, they told them what to do, they worked a miracle. And if you read John chapter 2, when there was lack of wine at the wedding of Cana, the Lord Jesus told the people, fill the jars with water. See, there was a human involvement to work a miracle. Whereas in this case, no human involvement. The oil comes mysteriously from the Bible, from paper. Right? From paper. Just like water came out of a stone. How, can, how to figure that out? No human hand was involved. That is how it's going to be in the last days. So if you are still in the old mindset of wanting someone to lay hands on you for a miracle, then you know what you're doing? You're holding up an umbrella over your head. Because the rains are all falling and instead of getting drenched in the rain, you're holding an umbrella because you have created an umbrella of a hindrance that God can only work through this source. Which God does too. But why go for second best when you can have the ultimate best? The ultimate best is a direct touch from God. Amen. The Lord Jesus himself come and lays his hands upon you. Which is far better than for a human hand to touch you. Right? See, this is where we miss the mark. We miss the times. Let me give you one example. This whole of today I was praying and waiting on God. And I prayed that the Lord will manifest His glory in the meeting. So traditionally, all preachers, what we do, first we preach the word. Then we pray for a miracle. We ask people all to come to the front and lay our hands and pray for a miracle. This is the traditional practice of all preachers. If it is a crusade, we follow the formula. The formula is sing some, no, not preach yet. First sing some heart pumping songs. Like the old fashioned Pentecostal songs that our ambassadors sang. Those kinds of songs. You know, after those heart thumping songs and you get all the hearts thump up, pumped up, and all fired up, then comes the preacher and he preaches one fiery sermon and increases the blood pressure in everybody. <laughs> That's exactly what we do, you know. So after increasing all the blood pressure, now it's time to pray for a miracle prayer to bring the pressure down. <laughs> so, so after a fiery message, now the step number three is to give an altar call for salvation of souls. So people get saved. Now comes the last part. Not the last part. The second last part is pray for healings. And we ask, so that method is done in several ways. The primary way is the old-fashioned way you give them a prayer card. And then you call the people to the front and somebody reads out the prayer, you lay hands and miracle takes place. If, miracle takes, if no miracle takes place, we'll tell them, have faith. <laughs> have faith. Or we tell them, the miracle will take place when you go back home. Right. And then another method is we ask them all to come to the front and we go on, on a mass laying of hands. And the third way is if there's a huge large crowd, you ask those who need a miracle to stand up and you pray a mass healing prayer. And God works wondrously, miraculously. Finally, we ask, how many of you were healed? Many people put up their hands. They come up right here. And share your testimony. And we call the cameraman. Cameraman, don't look anywhere there. <laughs> 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 uh, 
<laughs> we call the cameraman to come right up to the stage and they bring the camera right to your face. <laughs> and their testimonies are recorded and we say, look what great things God has done and everybody is happy and we tell those who have not received a miracle, if God can do for them, God can do for you tomorrow. <laughs> so, this is what we traditionally do, right? So, I came with that mindset. So first, a message. And then, at the end, we'll pray for everybody. But as I was praying, I saw the Lord Jesus Christ manifest as a lion of Judah in this place. As he came, I knew then what he was going to do. And then followed the prayer for healings and all that. You see, this is what God wants to do in these last days. No human involvement. So that no one takes, no man takes the credit. Just like the Lord Jesus was born in Mary's womb without the mixture of a male seed. Joseph did not touch her. But the Lord Jesus was born conceived supernaturally by the power of the Holy Spirit. This is what God wants to do in the last days. So we are just human agencies. Why God wants to do this in the last days? Because the generation past said to say the many, many wonderful men and women that God raised up to do his great awesome work have always taken the credit for themselves. I did this. I did that. These things happen in my ministry. And they publish many, many, nothing wrong doing all that, you know. But if you look at the miracles that the Lord Jesus did, like this morning I was meditating the scripture in John chapter 5, I was surprised to notice something that I've never noticed in times past that I've read that portion. The healing of the paralytic man by the pool of Bethesda. See, there were lots of sick people by the pool of Bethesda. And I have always preached like this. So the Lord Jesus went to this 38-year paralytic man and he healed them and he walked away. And I preached that. Why did the Lord Jesus simply walk away? He was expecting the rest of all the sick people after they had seen this miracle to come to the Lord Jesus to receive a miracle. This first miracle was a spark of faith. And many preachers today do the same thing. One miracle takes place, they ask for a testimony, and hearing of this testimony increases in the faith in everybody else. But that's not what John chapter 5 says. When you read to the whole passage, it says, after healing the man, the Lord Jesus walked away because there was a huge crowd. You know, I paused there and I read and I reread that scripture over and over again. Because this now was undoing what I had known before. I read and reread to make sure I'm reading right. He walked away because there was a huge crowd. And he didn't want to draw any attention. After healing that man, he just quietly walked away. Which tells us one thing. This is a pattern for this last day's work. You don't attract attention to yourselves. What God is going to do through you, remember, people of God, has no precedence in history. We should never make the mistakes that the former generation had done taking the credit to themselves. Learn from your peers. Learn from our forefathers. Never touch God's glory. God must be God. If you touch God's glory, then 
the curse of God will definitely come upon us. So upon all flesh, the next thing we read, that when the Spirit is poured out, what happens here? They will see visions, they will prophesy, they will dream dreams. If you compare these to the, what happened in Acts, they all spoke in unknown tongues. That's number one. One outward visible sign. Number two, the gifts of the Holy Spirit, which included the gift of prophecy, was abundant in the church. We read that in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. When they were all exercising the gifts, they did not know what it was all about. God gave revelation to the apostle Paul what they are and he outlined nine different gifts of the Holy Spirit. He said these are all that. So the nine gifts of the Holy Spirit were abundantly in manifestation in the early church. But in all of the nine gifts, you will never find visions, which was part of it, or dreams, which is part of it, prophesizing, which is part of it, but not exclusive. Whereas, in the Joel 2 anointing, you find that when the Holy Spirit is poured out, the exclusivity is they will see visions, they will prophesy, and they will dream dreams, period. So this tells us the Joel 2, 20 anointing that's going to be poured out in the last days is of the prophetic kind. It's not just a general gifts of the Holy Spirit that was poured out in the early church. Remember, that was the former reign. What you're going to get now is the former plus the latter reign. And the latter reign is of the prophetic kind. Number three, look at the scripture again. And I will pour out my spirit upon your sons and your daughters. Now sons and daughters, if you look at the Hebrew word, they refer to children 12 years old and below. Now you have never heard in history where 12 years old and below were prophesizing or they float in the prophetic anointing or they were prophets. There are some precedents or small examples in the Bible to show us that such things will take place in a greater dimension in the last days. For example, let's look at the first category, sons and daughters. In 1 Samuel chapter 3, you will read that baby Samuel, he was born because his mother prayed for a son to be born. So God answered the prayer and a son was born. Now the baby was born because the mother not only prayed for a son, she also made a vow. She said, Lord, if you bless my barren womb with a son, I will give the boy back to you. So God heard the prayer and a beautiful looking male boy was born. Handsome boy. Good hands, good legs, good mind, good eyes, good ears. Everything perfect. He was not lame. You know, sadly today, today in modern times, we give to God the lame, the blind, the deaf, the dumb, and the rejected to God. There are many mothers who have come to my meetings. They said, oh, we want to dedicate our son to God. And I look at the child, is maimed. It has got some kind of a deformity. And they also have other children who are well and good. So why didn't they want to give the children who are well and good? So the mother said, no, no, no. I need the well and good because he will work, earn money and take care of us. This is rejected. 
so I give it to God. Let God heal him and let God use him. See, look at how the deformity is not in the child, the deformity is in our minds. You don't want to give your best to God, you want to give your rejected to God. Some years ago, a missionary, American missionary, doing works in India, was going from her village to another village for ministry. So as she was walking, she came across a river and she needed to take a bridge to walk over. And she saw a mother sitting by the river bed and just weeping and crying. And she noticed her two sons by her side. And they were just standing, sitting there and they were playing in the sand and she was just weeping and weeping and crying. And the missionary did not know why the mother was doing that. So since she was in a hurry, she crossed the bridge, went over to the other side, did her work, and she came back. When she came back, after several hours, she still saw the mother seated there and weeping and crying. But there was something different. Instead of two boys, there was only one boy beside the mother. And she also noticed something, that the boy who was with the mother was lame in one leg. And the other boy she noticed earlier was normal. So she was very curious. So she stopped and she asked the woman what her problem was. So the woman poured out all her woes and her troubles, her misfortunes and all the bad luck that was upon her. She told the missionary everything. Then she, the missionary asked her, what are you doing here? Oh, I've been praying and crying to the gods in the river so that my bad fortune will turn around. So then the missionary asked, okay, what happened to your other son? Oh, then the mother said, oh, you know, I went and consulted a witch doctor in our village and the witch doctor said, if you will give one of your son as a sacrifice to the river god, then all your misfortune will be gone away and that's what I did. I just threw my son into the river as a sacrifice for the gods. So the missionary was shocked at what she was hearing. And then she composed herself and she said, okay, if you wanted to offer a sacrifice, why didn't you give, offer this lame boy as a sacrifice so that if you had kept the good boy, he could have worked and earned money to take care of you. As soon as this Hindu woman heard that, she jumped up with anger and shouted at the missionary and she said, How dare you speak like this? How can I give to my God what is lame? The missionary was shocked to hear that. And I was shocked to read that story because in Christianity, we only give the lame to God and keep the best for our own fleshy needs. Two years ago, a young man, about 23, wrote in to apply for a position in our ministry. So he's an engineer. So he wanted to work in our television network. So I, I interviewed him. He was a fine Christian young boy, very godly. He had a call on his heart and he wanted to use his engineering skills to work in a ministry-oriented organization rather than for the secular field. So I gave him an appointment letter and he was supposed to come and join us the following week. And the following week came and he did not show up. So my HR manager called this boy. And he did not answer the call. So a few days later, he sent me an email. He said, my dearly respected uncle, thank you for the offer that you gave me to work in your organization. I count it a great joy, a great privilege. However, I am sorry that I did not report for duty on that particular day. And the reason is because my parents told me, you are still very young. Don't go and work for God in your young age. 
go to the secular field and work all your life and after your retirement then go and work for God so the mother was saying give the best years of your life to the world and after when you're just weak and your all your energies are all gone and all your strength is gone when you are struggling to walk then give those last years to God see this is the attitude of Christian parents not all many sadly you know I have two sisters and one brother and when when they got married and they had children I told my sisters and my brother don't send your children into the secular world will dedicate all your firstborn to God and I drain this thought in my nephews and nieces from the day they were born I groom them for the work of God he said this is your call this is your destiny generation after generation we must serve the Lord Amen. so two of my nephews the first nephew belonging to my older sister and the first and the, the other nephew belonging to my the first child of my younger sister both of them are in full-time ministry right now see we we don't want to give them to the world not because they are dumb and stupid they are brilliant boys but you want to dedicate them see the every male that opens the womb belongs to God and not only the males even the females belong to God right because now there's no Greek no Gentile no male no female all are one in Christ Jesus so you want to offer them male or female to the works of God see your sons and daughters they shall prophesy so when Samuel was born after three years of weaning feeding the baby the mother brought you try to imagine you know I've often wondered when I read the scripture Samuel was three years old when the mother brought him to the temple handed him over to Eli and told Samuel from today he is your father he is your mother three three year old child and when the mother left we do not know whether he cried or whatever tantrums he did because the Bible didn't say anything whether he did or didn't do we don't know I like to think he didn't do because he was just too shocked that the mother introduced him <laughs> now I'll tell you a secret okay why he didn't cry from the day he was born till three years old the mother spoke the word into his ears day and night and she told him the vow she made you are called to be a prophet of God you are called to be a servant of God you are called to be a minister of God this is your destiny this is your destiny this is your destiny she spoke that day and night day and night day and night for three years of his life so when she eventually brought him and handed him over to Eli he knew that he has stepped into his destiny he knew that this is his destiny see your physical mind may not comprehend but your spirit knows your spirit knows so Eli was there three years old and from three years old to about five years old Eli then began to mentor him how to be a priest unto God he taught him the ways to be a priest he taught him how to minister unto God he taught him how to light up the lamps I saw this in a vision you know Eli would lift up the little boy and have the fire in light lamb in his hand and he would light each lamb on the menorah and pour the oil on the cups of the menorah Eli taught him all that and about two years later one day Samuel heard the audible voice of God talking to him and if you read first Samuel chapter 3 when the Lord appeared to him 
the Lord spoke to him. The manner of the prophecy that the Lord spoke to him was of an adult nature. It was not something that a five-year-old can understand or comprehend. Five-year-old boy had three blessings. Number one, his spiritual eyes were open. Number two, his spiritual ears were open. And number three, he received the gift of prophecy. So there you have a precedent in the Bible, an example how your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Number two, in Matthew chapter 21, when the Lord Jesus Christ was coming into Jerusalem, we read that a large company of people walked before him and a large company of people followed after him. And the company that went before him were many mothers carrying their little babies in their hands and they were all singing and they were all shouting and they were waving their palm leaves and they were singing Hosanna to the son of David who comes in the name of the Lord. Now when you read the passage, if you come to Matthew 21 verse 15 and 16, you will read something like this. That the Pharisees told the Lord Jesus, Master, rebuke the children and ask them to shut up. Now, I want you to think carefully now. There was a huge crowd of people. We do not know how many. Composed of adults, male and female. They were all singing songs. The male singing songs did not bother the Pharisees. But the little children, the babies and the thoughtless, their cryings bothered the Pharisees. Why? The babies and the thoughtless were not crying. They were singing songs. In Mark chapter 11, you will read that saying, the Pharisees' ears heard them crying, but God heard them singing songs of praises, singing, saying, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. That was what God was hearing them singing. Now that bothered the Pharisees. Why didn't he ask the Lord Jesus to ask the crowd to shut up? They didn't say that. But they only say, Lord, ask the kids to shut up. Why? Because some of the demons in them began to tremble at the voice of the children. Now why? Because of a fulfillment of the work of God that is going to take place in the lives of children in the last days. Turn your Bibles with me to Psalms chapter 8 and verse 2. Out of the mouth of babies and sucklings hast thou ordained strength because of thine enemies that thou mightest steal the enemy and the avenger. Now what does this mean? Out of the mouth of babies and sucklings, thou hast ordained praise. The praise that the babies and the sucklings are going to utter will release an anointing and cast out demons. That's what God is going to do through the children in the last days. You know, several years ago, one day I had a visitation from an angel of God during our monthly fasting and prayer meeting that we do in India. So while the worship was going on, this 8 to 10 foot angel appeared with a scroll in his hand and he unfolded the scroll and he began to read. He said, the time has now come for Psalms 8 to 2 to be fulfilled where the babies and the thoughtless, that means from 0 to 2 years old, they are going to cast out demons so then he rolled up the scroll and he said, announce this to the people. 
So during my message, I released this word and he said, this is what God is now going to do. The time has now come for the babies who are still, still drinking milk from their mother and the thoughtless. They, their ministry is going to begin. Now, have you ever heard anything like this in the past? Never. So there was a mother who had two babies. One, a newborn baby, a baby boy, and a six-year-old daughter with her. She was from a neighboring city called Bangalore in India. She was part of the 2,000 people who were in our meeting. She heard it, and she just left the meeting. When she went home, about six months later, something terrible began to happen in her home. Mysterious things happened where the pots and pans were all flying and they'll all be turned upside down in the night hours. Uh, you know, sometimes these cats, they like to roam the houses, in the, especially in the Indian streets. They all come out in the nights to look for food. So, you know, when people keep the windows open, they just jump through the windows because of their slim body. They can just wriggle past uh, the slim, no matter how large or small the windows are, cats have such an anointing, <laughs> a gift, you know. They can squeeze their bodies and go past through the small opening and enter into your house. And when they do that, they like to play football in the house. They like to kick the pots and pans. They turn things upside down. They are not very polite, you know. After eating, they will not wash the pots and pans. They just leave them like how your children do in your homes. Amen? Okay. So anyway, so this woman will come in the morning to her kitchen and she finds all her pots and pans turned upside down. So she thought it was the cats. So... This went on for several days. Then she began to put some reinforcement on the windows to make sure that no stray cats come in. Even then, she found all her pots and pens and utensils all been thrown away. She wondered how can the cat come. Maybe they went through school of translation. <coughs> and they were transported into the house. So she wondered what is happening, you know. She couldn't figure out how can the cat still come through the reinforced window, reinforced doors. Then she found out to her horror that the 12-year-old servant girl who works in a home was demon-possessed. And it was that girl who was throwing all the pots and pans upside down during the night hours when the demons began to manifest. So she was shocked. And she didn't know what to do with the girl because the girl was a relative. So she couldn't send the girl back. So she prayed not knowing what to do. This went on for some days. One day, she carried her son. Now by this time, her son had grown to 18 months. She carried now, what I'm telling you is a testimony from the mother. She carried the boy in her left hand, walked down from her bedroom to the kitchen to make milk for the baby. As she came near to the kitchen, the servant girl came out of the kitchen with a bottle of, bottle of milk for the baby. As the girl came out, the boy looked at the girl he lifted up his hand and just smiled. When he did that, the mother saw with her naked eyes dark spirits coming out of the girl and left the house. She was shocked. She saw her son. He just lifted up his hand towards the girl. He just he giggled. You know, like how babies giggle. They giggled and the spirits left. When she saw that, she remembered what I prophesied. That the babies and the suckling ones will cast out demons. And the following month she came to a meeting and she testified before the whole huge crowd what happened. 
So that proved what God is going to do in his last days. So your babies, your toddlers, they have powerful ministry in these last days. Amen! 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 That is why you must change your nursery curriculum. Your Sunday school curriculum, you must change. Don't just teach them to color. That is Old Testament concept. That is, those kind of Sunday school curriculum belongs to the old era. This is what the Lord clearly told me, you know. He said, you must now prepare the children to fit in their destiny. What is their destiny? To see visions and to prophesy. So therefore, teach them those things. Teach them how to see visions. Teach them how to prophesy. Teach them how to cast out demons. So when the Lord told me that, I had a question. I said, Lord, how can little, thoughtless babies understand the concept of visions and prophesying? And you know what the Lord told me? He said, that's not your problem. That's not your problem. Your duty is to teach them. It's my duty to make them understand. So when the Lord told me that, I quit figuring out how it's all going to take place. I said, all right, Lord. So we began to design special TV programs to teach the children what does it mean to see visions? And sometimes, you know, my old flesh will come and cross my mind. Do they really understand? Then I will say to myself, that's not my problem. That's not my concern. My, my duty is to teach them. And it is the Holy Spirit's duty to break them into smaller principles and concepts and make their little minds to understand what I'm teaching them. So that is the work of the Holy Spirit. He translates. Just like the prism, you know. When light passes through a prism, it breaks out into seven different colors. The Holy Spirit is like the prism. You teach. The Holy Spirit takes the truth and breaks them out into small, small pieces to make them understand. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. So he does that. But it doesn't stop there. And then the Lord told me one day, He said, I want you to start a new program for fetuses in the mother's womb. So I told the Lord, no, this is too much for me to understand. <laughs> so I asked the Lord, Lord, you told me to design programs for children. That I did. And I can understand the fact that children can come and sit before the TV and watch the TV programs. But how can a fetus in the mother's womb watch a TV program? Then the Lord told me, again, that's not your problem. <laughs> he said, you need to do one thing. Make, give out an invitation to women who are six months pregnant and above. Invite them to your studio and do a program and you speak and you tell them, God is going to anoint the babies in the womb like how he anointed John the Baptist when he was in the mother's womb. Why? Because there is a danger that's going to come to the last days prophetic babies that are going to be born. In Revelation chapter 12 verse 4 it says, The dragon sits before the pregnant woman to swallow the babies. So there's going to come a danger because a prophetic generation is going to come forth who is going to put the devil to flight. So before the army can come, kill the army. That is why the governments in this world are legislating abortion. Yes. This is nothing but a diabolical plan of the devil to kill all the future generations.